Welcome back to Christian's Colloquy. I'm so glad that you could join me again for another show. This week, timing isn't quite on my side. Despite last week having both Canada Day and the 4th of July for my American friends, today I'm talking neither about a Canadian or an American. Rather, I'll be speaking about an English person in church history. That person being none other than William Kiffin, as you can see in the title. William Kiffin, for those who aren't familiar with the name, was a profound, profound figure in Baptist history, one of the leading Calvinistic Baptists of all time, and perhaps the leading figure of the 17th century Baptist community. Truly a remarkable man. And this is something that I'm not just saying on my own. This has been recognized by Baptists and historians throughout history. So, perhaps to get you interested, let me read to you what a famous Baptist historian once said of William Kiffin. Joseph Ivany writes this, Kiffin was one of the most extraordinary persons whom the particular Baptist denomination has produced, both as to the consistency and correctness of his principles and the eminence of his worldly and religious character. There you go from uh, a Baptist historian, Joseph Ivany, a person I'll probably want to have a show on in his own right. But as he puts it, Kiffin is both looked to as an example for his theological correctness, his accuracy, his orthodoxy, but also his life, his character, both in religious and worldly spheres. It's, it's an amazing thing to say, and I can tell you Kiffin is a profound figure to be studying. With that sort of out of the way now, let me give you a brief roadmap of today's show. First, I want to start with a sketch of Kiffin's life. Again, major figure. I'll spend a little more time getting into the ins, of, ins and outs of who he is and perhaps lay, a, lay another roadmap for future episodes. But then I want to move on and briefly discuss where I encountered Kiffin. As some of you who watch know, I'm, I'm quite uh, fond of that trip to England I took. And again, I want to share a little bit more of my experience, especially what took place on that trip. Finally, I'm going to end the show. Instead of looking at one of Kiffin's works today, today I'm going to spend a little more time talking about secondary resources. I'm going to share a few of the books that I have appreciated, that I have read, that really cover some of the key points and figures of Baptist history. Just some of those books. There are many, but I'll start recommending some of those so that those of you who are interested, I get a lot of questions on from different places about that so that you might have a place to to get started and start looking into books to read for yourself. So that's the plan for this show, and why don't we dive in right now to the facts of Kiffin's life. Kiffin was born in London in 1616. Due to a plague outbreak which killed his parents, Kiffin was orphaned at age 9 and placed in the care of a glover with whom he apprenticed. Stopping right there, I think we notice a point that's going to keep coming up and has come up in previous shows. A lot of these early Baptist figures have very humble origins. A lot of them are finding themselves, originally anyway, in the lower classes. The Baptist movement as a whole has often struggled this with the perception that it is a lower class movement. In England, as we saw with Bunyan and now Kiffin, they're part of these lower trades people and apprenticing and doing these sorts of things, which, as we know today and rightly acknowledge, are important, necessary jobs. But speaking about the, the social understanding in those times, definitely on the lower end of the spectrum. And that's even even present in Canadian history. If we talk about Canadian Baptists and their origins, especially in the Ontario area, we'll recognize that early Baptists often aren't recognized as respectable or part of the societal elite, using air quotes on a lot of those things. I shouldn't have used on societal, just elite. But that's a common theme and one that we see in Kiffin. Baptist leaders having humble, very humble origins. Let's dive back in. A few years later, Kiffin would run away from his master. But in the midst of his flight, he happened to encounter and listen to the preaching and teaching of Thomas Foxley, a very famous early Puritan. This Puritan sermon changed Kiffin's life. He felt extremely convicted by the preaching because it just so happened in God's providence that Foxley's sermon was on the topic of 
the duty of servants to their masters. What incredible timing. And after that sermon, Kiffin was cut to the heart, and he did two things. First of all, he returned to his master. He returned to the master of his trade so that he might continue to study and learn under him. But perhaps more important to this sketch and this theologically focused biography, it's from that point onward that Kiffin decided he would continue to seek out Puritan teaching and preaching. And it's from that point on that as he grew up in his teenage years that he continued to seek out and hear the preaching of Puritans like John Davenport. Davenport being one of the co-founders of the New Haven Colony in New England, one of those great early American Puritans who was also active in England. Also, Kiffin would listen to the preaching of John Goodwin. Goodwin stands out here as he is one of the few Arminian Puritans, Puritanism often being closely associated with Calvinism for very good reason, but uh, Goodwin shows that it wasn't simply and wasn't exclusively a Calvinistic movement. There were many Puritans who were embracing Arminian perspectives or somewhere in between. Needless to say, and I could go on longer, but for our sketch today, it's important to now point out that it was under the preaching of these Puritans that Kiffin was converted. And he was converted in a powerful way, becoming quite passionate about God and his truth. From that point on, Kiffin committed himself to studying the Word of God, and he studied largely in the context of his local church. Kiffin explains in his own writings that with his young friends, he would commit to prayer before the service, Bible study after the service, and all around being taking advantage of all the theological opportunities he had for himself. But it's also important to point out that Kiffin, like many other Puritan and separatist leaders and figures at this time, did not have formal theological education. Whether it was because it was too expensive or the laws wouldn't allow them to pursue it, Kiffin, like many Baptists, Puritans, and other groups, would have no opportunity and would, a lot of them, no desire to seek out formal theological education and training in one of the great colleges and universities of England. Despite this lack of formal education, however, Kiffin would go on to be an able teacher and preacher. Clearly, from my perspective and those who lived around him, he was being equipped and was equipped by God for the task of preaching and being a pastor. In the 1630s, though, life would again change for Kiffin. It was in 1633 that William Laud would become Archbishop of Canterbury, the leading Anglican church position of the day. And unfortunately for Kiffin and many other Puritans, Laud was a zealous Arminian, and more importantly, he was committed to ritualism, the medieval rituals, the vestments, the candles, the sign of the cross, all those things. He was deeply committed to those things. And from his position of influence, he would begin a ruthless campaign of persecution against the Puritans. There are many, many stories of the persecution of the Puritans under Laud. And this is where I might pause to say, we've talked about it in a few other episodes, but this is one of those lead-ups to the English Civil War, this persecution. Many of the Puritans who were already on the side of Parliament really resented the persecution of Laud, really saw it as an act of tyranny that was associated with the king and the standing Anglican church. And again, when we think persecution, we, we have to recognize that it was pretty brutal. We're talking about ears and noses being sliced off in addition to fines and imprisonments. Going back to Kiffin, however... Kiffin and his fellow Puritans were now left with a choice. They either had to fall in line with Laud, escape persecution by fleeing to the Netherlands, which had a history of Protestantism and tolerance, or to one of their colonies in New England. And a, a final option they had was to stay in England, but to continue worshipping according to the scripture while facing persecution. 
Kiffin chose this final option. He didn't submit to Laud's instructions and he didn't flee. Rather, he stayed in England, committed to scripture, and joining what many would call the illegal congregations. Deciding to stay and worship according to the scripture was a big decision for Kiffin, especially since there was the threat of persecution. Therefore, Kiffin wisely, I believe, chose to then deeply search and study the scriptures. If he was going to be committed to worshiping according to them, he wanted to make sure he actually did that. If he was going to risk persecution to stick with the scripture, he wanted to make sure he understood the scripture and what it instructed and directed for worship. After doing this study, in 1638, Kiffin felt it necessary to leave the Church of England. He left the Puritan party within the Church of England and then joined an independent congregation. Again, as discussed in the Brilliana Harley episode, Puritan can be used in two different ways, either for the Puritan party within the Church of England or those who embraced a Puritan spirituality, there being a lot of overlap between the two. So essentially, Kiffin now transitioned from the Puritan party in the Church of England to an independent congregation, which was still shaped by Puritan spirituality. It was in this independent congregation that Kiffin would come under the pastoring of Samuel Eaton, another famous Puritan theologian. Interesting and sadly though for Kiffin was that when he joined Eaton's church, Eaton would actually be in prison and would die within a year, leaving that independent congregation without a pastor. Within a few years though, after being asked to preach and teach several times, Kiffin was then made the pastor of the church. Soon after this point, in 1642, Kiffin and the congregation, after doing more study and praying together, they would together as a congregation embrace Baptistic convictions. So again, to give a brief overview, Kiffin, after being converted, falls in line with the Puritan party of the church in England. After doing some study and research, especially on the issues of worship and polity church government, he feels it necessary to leave the Church of England to join an independent congregation. As an independent, fully committed to scripture and going wherever it teaches, no matter the cost, Kiffin and his congregation conclude that they must embrace Baptistic convictions, basically becoming Credo Baptists, practicing believers' baptism. From this point on, Kiffin, after becoming a Baptist, would swiftly rise to becoming one of the leading particular Baptists in the entire country. So to give now a brief overview of this decade of the 1640s, it's important to acknowledge three points of Kiffin's life and importance. Firstly, Kiffin would become pastor of one of seven particular slash Calvinistic Baptist churches in England. Again, particular Baptists being Baptists who hold to Calvinistic soteriology. They believe in the particular atonement, particular redemption. So Kiffin would stand as only one of seven of those Baptist ministers who were particular Baptists. But from that position, Kiffin would play a significant role in drafting the 1644 London Baptist Confession of Faith. The 1644 then being edited into the 1646 London Baptist Confession of Faith. One of those great Baptist confessions that actually stands the test of time that many churches still look to and use today. Kiffin was one of the major players on that committee writing this confession. A third point, and perhaps the most significant and the most intricate point, is that William Kiffin led Baptists in their support of Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell lead, leading the English Republic in the late 1640s into the 1650s, all in and around and after the era of the English Civil War. This is an especially significant point because this is when Baptists really grew. Baptists who were starting off as seven churches in 1644 would spread into the hundreds during the time of Cromwell, spreading across England, but importantly, also spreading to Ireland. 
It's here in Ireland where, where Kiffin would be incredibly active through letters, as the Irish Baptist churches that were being planted and were coming alongside Cromwell's army as it moved through, they would have a, a few controversies they had to work through. Part of it being simple theological questions, but there was also the reality of what Cromwell's military campaign looked like and the rise of a millennial movement, of an eschatological sect the fifth monarchists who rose up and threatened to divide the unity of the Baptist churches in Ireland. Kiffin was very much involved in that. There's so much more that could be said about these few points here, but I want to let you know now not to worry, not to fear. In the future, I will certainly have episodes or perhaps an interview on Baptist confessions, especially the first and second London Baptist confessions. And I will also have an episode on Oliver Cromwell. Such an interesting character, often gets a bad rap with uh, some legitimate reasons there, but also a tremendous man, a pious man, despite his mistakes and errors and questionable choices, he was clearly a man with a spirituality worth studying. So again, big topics here, but Baptist Confessions and Cromwell, we will come back to in the future. Getting back to Kiffin though. While playing a great theological role in the 1650s, it is also important to mention that Kiffin would also become an exceedingly wealthy merchant during this period. Right now, as you can see, looking at his picture, while Kiffin dressed like many Baptists and many Puritan theologians of his day, you'll notice that he has lace on his clothing. He's embroidered up. That was very expensive and a sign that he was indeed a wealthy merchant. And when I say wealthy, I mean filthy, stinking rich. He was incredibly successful, becoming one of the richest merchants in England. It is also important to recognize, in addition to his theological legacy and his massive footprint in the world of commerce and economics, he was also active in politics. During Cromwell's reign, he also became a member of parliament. Kiffin was a Baptist pastor who had, uh, who had his finger in many different pots in many different parts of the world. Definitely an impressive figure with an impressive mind. It is reported, uh, as you might be wondering, that it was despite or alongside this rapid rise from lower class, as we mentioned, a lower class Baptist Puritan minister to an exceedingly wealthy, wealthy merchant, that many report that Kiffin maintained his moral standing and humility. As we will see later on, he used his great wealth for the good of God's kingdom, for the good of God's people, particularly Baptists, and we'll discuss that soon. In 1660, things would take a turn. The monarchy would be restored, and the restoration of the monarchy would lead to another hard time for Baptists and other Puritan groups. As we mentioned in this episode and previous episodes, when the king returned, uh, he was not thrilled with Baptists. Baptists who, again, were filling up large parts of Cromwell's army and certainly one of his greatest support groups during his decidedly non-anti-monarch reign. So, not a good time for Baptists. But it was during this time of increased persecution that Kiffin began putting his wealth and influence to amazing use. Despite himself, despite Kiffin being jailed a number of times for his Baptist faith, eventually he would find himself in the king's circles. At one point, the king even had to ask Kiffin for a loan of 40,000 pounds. Yeah, it might not sound like a lot if we're thinking today, or it, might, it probably does sound like a lot, but believe me when I say that in 1660s, 40,000 pounds was an insane sum of money. It was so large that it was totally recognized in that time that the king would never be able to repay that loan. So what did Kiffin do instead? Instead of giving the king a 40,000 pound loan, he gave him a 10,000 pound gift. And the king happily received this. And from that point, he was in a sense indebted to Kiffin's generosity. An interesting turn of events. The king of England was going to a Baptist who were known to be of lower class for a large loan and getting a gift. 
With his influence then, Kiffin would intercede for many persecuted Baptists. One example of this intercession of Kiffin was when there were a group of 12 general Baptists who were faith facing a death sentence for their faith. And we might be thinking, oh, Kiffin would be excited, particular Baptists were the arch rivals of the general Baptists, but that wasn't the case. Kiff Kiffin in a great sign of Christian unity and Christian love and benevolence, he actually wrote a letter to the king asking him to show them mercy, which the king did. An amazing display by Kiffin, using his wealth and influence not to escape his persecution, but rather to try and help other Baptists in the midst of the shared persecution. During this time, in addition to his political activities, Kiffin was also theologically active. Even though Baptists were still a persecuted group during this time, they still had their fair share of theological discussions and controversies. Most notably, in the early 1680s, Kiffin would enter into a major theological debate over the matter of communion. His main opponent, interestingly enough, is none other than John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress. And while I will now briefly touch on what was going on, what they were debating over, it might be interesting to acknowledge that in Kiffin's time, in Bunyan's time, it was Kiffin who was the superstar in England. While Bunyan had written some books, he was relatively not well known in that age. While people knew his preaching, he wasn't the end-all and be-all of Baptist life. Rather, it was Kiffin who was the one that people were really looking to and hoping to learn from. So what was this debate between Kiffin and Bunyan all about? The two would disagree on the topic of open versus closed communion. Kiffin being a proponent of the latter and writing his major work, A Sober Discourse of Right to Church Communion. Essentially, Bunyan was open membership, open communion. He wanted all Christians to be welcome into the membership of his church, regardless of their baptisms and baptistic convictions, and he wanted all to be welcome to the Lord's table. Kiffin, however, was on the side of closed membership and closed communion. Only those who were baptized, rightly baptized, by immersion, should be members of the church. And only those who are rightly baptized members of the church should take part of the Lord's Supper in a church. That was a major conversation for Baptists. While Bunyan, as I mentioned, is better remembered today, Kiffin was that prominent figure. And he, looking from his writings, did an amazing job arguing his case. And from that point, his view, Kiffin's view, of close communion would become the dominant view among particular Baptists from that point on. And it's important to recognize that this closed communion view would be the dominant view of Baptists for centuries to follow. It's relatively recently in Baptist history that we see a move, especially in English-speaking North America, toward open communion, that all are welcome to the Lord's table, assuming they profess faith. For most Baptists, and certainly a large number of Baptists today, they will take quite seriously fencing the table, guarding the table, making sure that it's only members in good standing who approach the Lord's table. That again might be a theological conversation I will approach on this show in a future episode. Getting back to Kiffin, however, things would once again turn really bad for Kiffin in 1685. James II, a Roman Catholic, would take the English throne in 1685. And there would be three years of terrible tyranny and strife. Strife which saw two of Kiffin's grandsons be executed for supporting a Protestant claimant to the throne. The situation would finally turn around again in 1688. In 1688, there was the Glorious Revolution, a great event in English history when the Protestants of England, working together, called William of Orange from the Netherlands, the husband of Mary II, to come to England and rule in James II's stead. One of those great moments in history when politics and religion really mesh together to form interesting events. And William would come and he would be successful. He would become the King of England instead of James. 
And this was amazing for Baptists, Puritans, and other groups alike, especially for men like Kiffin who were leading these movements. William of Orange, being a Dutch Protestant, would usher in another era of tolerance and liberty for Baptists. He, being from the Netherlands, which already was known for its tolerance, again, they were accepting refugees from, uh, from, the Eng- from England and from throughout Europe who were facing persecution, and now this sort of figure was leading England. Great time for Baptists. It was because of this newfound freedom and because of this new age of toleration and tolerance that Baptists were then free to hold a national assembly in 1689. A very important year for Baptists. You'll often hear it if you spend time online in reform circles, the year 1689. What made this year important? This was the year when the particular Baptists formally adopted the Second London Confession of Faith. A document which was originally written in 1677, which they were now able to formally embrace. The 1689, the Second London Baptist Confession, as it's often known, being one of the most influential Baptist documents to this day. If you're in a Baptist church that's part of a major association, it's very likely that your statement of faith at your church can be traced back from edits and revisions and um, condensed forms of the 1689. Truly a remarkable document. Returning to Kiffin though, Kiffin's final years were not easy. After already losing his first wife and three of his children in the previous decades, In 1698, near Kiffin's death, Kiffin's second wife would defraud him. It's a a terrible tragedy that ends with her being refused communion. Just a hard, hard reality of domestic trouble in Kiffin's life. On top of that, in that same year, another one of Kiffin's sons would die. By the time of Kiffin's death in 1701, his life was full full of pain. But... It is clear from his writings that he never lost sight of his Savior Jesus Christ, and he died safe and comforted in the arms of his Lord. While there was a lot of hardship near the end, we can know from Kiffin's writings, we can see from his attitudes, from reports about his life, that he never once lost his faith in Jesus Christ. He was preserved to the end. What a beautiful end despite the pain. With Kiffin's biological sketch, uh, biographical sketch now complete, I want to turn briefly to my experience learning about Kiffin. As I mentioned, I went on that England trip in 2017, and on one of those days, the tour group went to Oxford. And while we were in Oxford, we visit, visited Regent's Park College. For those who don't know, it's not uh, something common, I believe, uh, to just know what these colleges are about. But Regents Park College is a very famous Baptist-related college. It has deep ties with the Baptist movement historically. And to this day, while it's not something I would consider evangelical or conservative, they do continue to train Baptist ministers. Part of the college... Regents Park College, is the Angus Library and Archive. This library contains many historic Baptist works. As you can see on your screens now, I took pictures of some of these. You can find first or early editions of the works of John Bunyan. You can find uh, the early Baptist confessions and a whole host of other Baptist works. They have works from Baptists defending their faith, and they also have the additions attacking Baptists, accusing them of being Anabaptists and other similar works. It was also during this visit to this college and library that I met Larry J. Kreitzer. This guy, Kreitzer, is the foremost historian of William Kiffin. In addition to having a very pleasant conversation with him, he also gave the group a lecture on Kiffin, speaking about his life and influence. I believe that uh, this was a profound moment for me, especially looking back and reflecting on it. It was at this college, seeing these works, that I really began to understand the significance of physical history. 
the purpose of things like museums and galleries and different centers of learning where you can actually see historical pieces of literature, where you can actually see early editions or original works of art. It's by seeing these things and encountering things, I think we begin to understand the relevance and the actual impact of history. That while we can talk about it in the abstract, by seeing these things, by seeing these books, these pieces of art, these ancient historic churches, we understand that these people that we're studying, these events that we're discussing, these doctrines that we're debating, aren't just things we hold in our head. They actually happened. People actually wrote these books. People actually had these debates. People actually worshipped in these churches. That's something that I think brings us to the reality that what we do now, what we do today, really matters. The same way we look back and see what they did and appreciate it, and hopefully appreciate it more by seeing it, one day people will look back at us and do the same thing. I think on this trip, seeing those pieces of Baptist literature, having that lecture, walking in this college, that this is true of the whole trip, I really began to understand how our history, how history in general, can really and should really come alive. While it's great to have the head knowledge and know all these events, we must also remember that these were truly events. These were truly events that often costed people great prices to be a part of or to be in and involved with. It's an amazing thing. I would encourage you, if you have a chance, go on tours, visit museums, check it out for yourself. With all that said, I could safely say from my reading for Kiffin from this trip, I really appreciate who Kiffin is. He remains today, for me, one of the great influences in my theological life. His works, his story, his influence is something that still shapes me to this day as I encounter it and learn more about it. I think Kiffin has rightly earned his place being called a quintessential Puritan, being recognized as one of the leading Baptists of the 17th century. One of the few Baptist leaders who was present for both the first and second London Baptist Confessions of Faith. Those two great confessions that still shape Baptist belief, thought, and identity to this day. Kiffin, in a lot of ways, looms so large over Baptist, whether we recognize it or, lo or not. So, saying that, I now want to recommend to you, my audience, some books that you can read to really understand your history better. If you're a Baptist, so that you can really understand Baptist history. And even if you're not a Baptist watching this show, you might have, you probably have Baptist friends. You probably wonder who Baptists are. You probably have ideas of what Baptists believe, but not sure how they came to those beliefs, how, do, how they came to those positions. So right now, I'm going to briefly look at and present some of the books that I have found helpful to help me understand who Baptists are, where we come from, and why we believe what we believe. The first book I want to mention is this big yellow book right here by Larry Kreitzer, the man, the gentleman that I met, the foremost Kiffin historian. He actually has a series entitled William Kiffin and His World. These books, I believe they're on seven volumes. They are no joke that these are some thick, thick books. I'd only recommend it if you're really interested in Kiffin. Maybe you're a Baptist seminarian or maybe you're a pastor looking to learn more about history, but... If that's you, this would be a fantastic series to check out. This really unpacks not only his theological life, the documents that were surrounding him, the controversies he was involved with, but also gets a bit into his political and commerce side. So really, seven volumes, you probably, you might not want them all, but it's worth checking out, exploring them. And if you can, if you run across it, certainly worth checking out in a library or getting your hands on a physical copy. I should also mention here, thinking about this book and my time with uh, Larry Kreitzer in Oxford, that's also when I learned about a, perhaps a darker side of William Kiffin, something I still have to wrestle with. 
in his engagement in commerce activities, evidence has come to life. I didn't research this much myself, and this was only coming out a few years ago, that there perhaps is evidence that Kiffin, as a merchant, was involved in the Atlantic slave trade. Not directly, and it was certainly not a major part of his business. We know a lot about his business, and it's not there commonly. But there is perhaps evidence that he was involved in some of the ships taking slaves from West Africa to the Caribbean islands or to America, to the colonies. That just is a reminder that while we can hold theological people, while we can hold churchmen and theologians up in high esteem, we must remember that they were people. This is a topic I bring up knowing that this is a common discussion in 2020. Right now, as this show comes out, this is a major debate, especially as people wrestle with the statues we have up in our universities, in our cities, where we have figures who have checkered pasts. And I myself must admit that some of my most influential figures, some of the people I look up to highly in history, William Kiffin being one, George Whitfield being another, have some had some opinions that I struggle with today, that I am shocked by today, especially as they relate to slavery and the slave trade. That's something I think we all have to work out. But what I want to mention today is that that truth, whether it's there or not, doesn't change their other good deeds. While Kiffin could have been involved in the slave trade, I will still look up to him as a great Baptist figure who had a lot of wonderful things to say for Baptists and for Christians at large, a man who was known for his generosity and piety. That's a big deal I recognize, but I will mention here, it's also cool getting to know that how many Baptist figures were also the ones leading the charge against slavery. And that will certainly come up in future episodes. While there might be a checkered past for some Baptists and Evangelicals, we also must remember that Baptists and Evangelicals were the ones leading the charge against slavery, who were on the front lines of the abolition movements. So that's a brief aside. Getting back to the books now. Another book that I've shown before on the Keech episode is Kiffin, Knowles, and Keech, Rediscovering Our English Baptist Heritage by Dr. Haken. Great book. I read it again in preparation for these episodes. Highly recommend you check it out. In addition to having episodes on each of these Baptist uh, episodes, in addition to having chapters on each of these Baptist figures, uh, Haken includes chapters on the Baptist confessions and a few other points in Baptist history. Definitely worth checking out. Not a super long read and super interesting. Perfect combo. Another book I recommend you check out is called Calvinism, Communion, and the Baptists. This is a great book by Peter Naylor. It touches upon and touches upon, gets deep into how Baptists have historically related to communion. A lot of people I know wonder, oh, Baptists, how are they viewing the Lord's Supper? Are they on the memorialism side? Are they closer to Calvin's side? In history, how did they change from having a Calvinistic, Calvin reform view to a Zwinglian memorialist view, whatever we want to call them? This book gets into a lot of the historic controversies in the Baptist world and how they debated communion, how they thought of it, how they grew on the topic, and how we got to where we are today. So if you're wondering about Baptists and communion, the theology, the practice, definitely a book you want to check out. Another book you want to check out on a similar topic, a lot of people wonder about Baptist polity, our church government, how come we don't have synods, how come we don't have bishops in a monarchical sense, well this book gets into Baptist polity, especially in the early years, Edification and Beauty by James Renahan. Fantastic book. I've read it a couple times now. Gets into the early Baptist figures, how they were thinking about the role of pastors, the role of deacons, the role of associations and fellowships and conventions, that sort of thing, in the earliest days of Baptist history from 1675 to 1705. Definitely uh, Kiffin is well regarded in this book, mentioned in this book, and so many other great Baptist figures in history. 
the final work I want to recommend you check out is Faith and Life for Baptists. This book, I haven't read through it all, I must confess, but I have read through sections and chapters, gets into those early Baptist confessional documents, those early Baptist documents and uh, church life, and really looks at how Baptists were applying their polity, how Baptists were actually living out their church government through their documents and decisions. So if you're interested in Baptist polity, what that looks like, how it developed, and how it really shaped where we are today, definitely another book you want to check out. I have a lot more books that I could recommend on Baptist history, especially as they relate to Baptist covenant theology, but I think five for today is more than enough. So with all that said, going through Kiffin, talking about my experience with him, sharing some books, I now must hope and say I wish that this episode is helpful to you. I hope that it really opened up your eyes to some of the deep richness of the Baptist tradition, that you're now better equipped and better, have a deeper and better understanding of who Baptists are and where we came from. Kiffin is a figure that looms large in the Baptist story. So if you have any questions, please leave them down below. I've been getting a few more, not just on YouTube, but other places. But if you do have a question and you're watching this on YouTube, please leave it down below. Or if you have a comment or a suggestion for a future episode, also leave that down below. Again, as I said in previous times, if you could leave a like on the show, if you can share this, that would be so great. I would love it if I can have a wider audience so that I can hear and have more voices to interact with. That's the goal of this show, not just to have me talking, but to hear what my audience is saying and to have a dialogue with each other and the figures in the past that we are discussing. With all that said, finally... I hope that this was a good time for you. Thanks for sticking around to the very end. And I look forward to seeing you here again on Christian's Colloquy next Monday. Take care.